Hello, and thank you for your interest in the Mellon ACLS Dissertation Innovation Fellowships, which are offered by the American Council of Learned Societies, or ACLS. Our agenda includes a brief introduction to ACLS. We will then move into an overview of this program, including its goals and the core application components. Finally, we'll look over some tips for creating an effective application. Founded in 1919, ACLS is a small private nonprofit organization headquartered in New York City. We are a federation of 81 scholarly societies, including major disciplines in the humanities and interpretive social sciences. Organizations such as the MLA, APA, CAA, and AAA are our members, as well as many associations representing subdisciplines and interdisciplinary fields as well. I hope you will take a moment to go to our website to learn more about our membership. We are interested in being as broadly encompassing of humanistic inquiry as we can be, and to bring voices from various fields of humanistic studies to the table to help us set the agenda for the direction of humanistic research and inquiry. Our mission at ACLS is the advancement of humanistic studies in all fields of the humanities and social sciences, and the maintenance and strengthening of the national societies dedicated to those studies. One way we do that is by working with learned societies to think about issues of shared concern and to come up with ways to address those issues and support scholars broadly at a variety of institutions. At ACLS, we also provide direct support for research through fellowships and grants, and we offer multiple programs in any given year. Some of them are also designated for early career doctoral students, especially in fields like American art, China studies, or Buddhist studies. I encourage you to take a look at our full roster of offerings throughout the year as we are often adding new programs. We'll be supporting nearly 400 fellows over the course of this competition year, and those fellows will be selected from between 3,000 and 4,000 applications across all of our programs. Each year, we work with between 600 to 700 peer reviewers to help us select our fellows and grantees, and those peer reviewers also provide feedback to all applications. Even if an applicant may not be able to win a fellowship in a given year, they can receive feedback to improve not just their project, but also their proposals. This year, we'll be offering up to 45 dissertation innovation fellowships, and those awards consist of a $52,000 package of stipends. That's a $42,000 stipend for the academic year with up to $5,000 in project costs and $3,000 in research funds. These funds are intended for travel to collections or field work. In addition to research costs, some fellows regularly incur project costs related to working with community partners and exploring digital methods or purchasing equipment necessary to move the project forward. The $5,000 in project costs would go towards these expenses. In addition to these funds that go directly to the fellow, an additional $2,000 is included for fellows to work with an external mentor. That's someone who would be external to your advisory committee if you have one set up already. The mentor you choose should be someone who sits outside of your current advising relationships. The goal with the external mentor is to allow fellows to broaden their intellectual networks and to get advice and perspectives outside of their current advisors. The tenure of the award is the 2025-2026 academic year. In addition to the monetary support that this fellowship provides, we will provide some professional development opportunities, including webinars and workshops, as well as opportunities for networking among members of the fellow community, the dissertation innovation community, but also more broadly across ACLS's community of scholars and alumni and reviewers. Our full eligibility criteria are listed on our website, and I strongly encourage everybody to view our competition page where the eligibility criteria are outlined. What you see here is an abbreviated version, but I want to stress that the full eligibility criteria are best read on our website. To be eligible, applicants must be a PhD student in a humanities or social sciences department in the United States. You must be able to take up a full year of sustained research and training and you have to be released from normal teaching, curricular, and administrative responsibilities. This fellowship cannot be combined with any other kind of significant responsibility, 
or significant fellowship. All fellows must have completed at least two years in their programs and have finished all required PhD coursework by the start of the fellowship term. Finishing your required coursework before you embark on this fellowship will enable you to have sufficient grounding in your department and in your field to know exactly what the context for your innovative work will be. The other eligibility criteria is that no applicant can have achieved ABD status before January 1st, 2024. This is to ensure that writing and research are not well underway. This fellowship year is intended to help you explore, expand, and experiment in ways that will significantly define the dissertation project. One of the primary goals of this fellowship is to support emerging scholars who are preparing to embark on innovative dissertation projects. This is not a dissertation completion fellowship. We are really looking for people who are at the early stages of dissertation research and writing. However, during the course of the pandemic, we know many interruptions have happened across departments, schools, and in the individual research plans of graduate students. So you have an opportunity to describe in the application any significant delays to your progress that have meant that even though you are ABD, you have not yet made significant progress on your dissertation project. The strongest applications will be able to demonstrate the context of their innovation within your field and your department, in your school, and in the specific fields and subfields you're trying to intervene within. That's why it's essential that fellows have completed all coursework and gone through some years of graduate training so that you can adequately address where you think your innovation can make a real intervention. We welcome applications that propose different scholarly methodologies, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work, collaborative work, or publicly engaged work. We are also interested in thinking about different modes of scholarly practice. That could mean that you're thinking about working with audiences beyond the academy. What impact would your work have on these audiences? Another way to think through this is to ask yourself, how does the innovative work, methodology, or approach help me better answer the questions that animate my dissertation? What will it allow us to do that we couldn't do beforehand? What kinds of audiences will it help us reach? Please feel free to contact us at fellowships at acls.org if you have any questions about the definition of innovation. ACLS's own, even as I've just described it, is incredibly broad. I encourage you to look at the abstracts of this year's fellows projects to see the types of interventions that our fellows are taking on. I'm going to go briefly through the application and review process, but before we jump in, I'd like to emphasize that grant writing is a skill that improves with practice and grant writing is distinct from academic writing or scholarly writing. The first components of the application are fairly straightforward informational sections, asking for your name, address, educational background, and employment information. These sections are what we are calling the common profile, which creates a profile for you with some basic information that carries over to another application if you apply for more than one ACLS fellowship in one year. The next section of the application includes the Dissertation Innovation Fellowship specific questions, which ask how long you've been in your program and some optional demographic questions. You'll also be asked to provide a title for your project, an abstract, which should be a brief description of the project and the innovative research and dissertation project directions you will pursue, and a second abstract that provides broader context for the stakes of your work to an interdisciplinary audience. At ACLS, the peer review for our largest programs is always interdisciplinary, and your application will be read by people within your own field at the first round of review, but the second stage is always interdisciplinary, which is why it is crucial to make sure that you are making clear the larger stakes of your project. That page with your title and abstract and the broader significance of the stakes of your research is the first page that reviewers see the title and abstract and broader significance statement are the first impression you'll be making. You'll 
also be asked to select, via drop-down menus, the type of innovation you'll be using in your project. We'll also ask you questions about the fields of study you're intervening in, the subject matters that you're engaging with, and the kinds of geographies that are going to be addressed by your application. That will be used by ACLS program staff to match you to the best first round peer reviewers. So make sure that you're taking this seriously and carefully selecting those fields. Below those drop down menus, you'll be asked to describe in greater detail the innovative aspect of your project. In addition, you'll be submitting a proposal of up to seven pages that will contain a project description and the aims of your research. What kinds of supports are going to be necessary for you to execute your project? Will you be using a particular archive or partner with another organization? We will want to see that you've done the necessary research as to how to access that archive or establish a relationship with the organization. You'll want to demonstrate that you know exactly what is going to be needed to make this innovative work happen. The program comes with funds for an external mentor. You might not have that mentor in mind, you might not have come up with the name, or you might not have secured an agreement for mentorship at the time of application. That's perfectly fine. At this point, if you don't have a specific person in mind, it's really important to say what kind of qualities and support you're going to need from an external mentor to ideally make this project succeed and thrive. Whether or not you have a specific person in mind, we ask that you show that you're thinking through exactly why you need that person to be an external mentor for you and what they're going to be adding to the perspectives or to the definition of your problem. We know that the applications come far before the fellowship starts. We will ask you to cement that relationship by the start of the fellowship and to confirm it with ACLS. It's very important to address both the kind of innovation and the timing and intervention of this fellowship within your doctoral program and your research project. Where exactly will you be in the arc of your project in the next academic year? Where will this fellowship take you and what will it set you up to do? It is very important to signal to the peer reviewers that you know that this project has a beginning, middle, and an end, and that you know exactly how the resources offered by the fellowship over the academic year are going to move you closer to that goal. As part of the application, you'll also need to provide a timeline and work plan of one page and a bibliography of up to two pages. For the timeline, you must use the template that we have provided on the website. You must provide a short personal statement describing your journey as a scholar and how your work comes together at the nexus of personal experience, research interests, and the desire to shift the forms and formats of academic research. This personal statement should be no more than two pages. Please provide a work sample of no more than 15 pages, double spaced. We are calling it a work sample and not a writing sample, though we know that most of these samples will be submitted to us in writing. Some submissions might look like a blog post or a catalog entry or another kind of project that relates to the kind of work that you want to accomplish in your dissertation project. Please do use the space afforded to you to pick the best example of your work, ideally something that will demonstrate to the reviewers exactly what your capacity is to carry forward the kinds of work on your dissertation that you're proposing. All applications must be accompanied by a letter of recommendation from your PhD advisor, or if you don't have one yet, someone who would potentially serve in that capacity, and one statement of institutional support, which is meant to affirm that you are meeting the eligibility requirements of this program and that the tuition and fees are going to be covered for the year. Typically, either your DGS, department chair, or dean would complete the institutional statement. We understand that every institution is different in the way that they handle fellowships for doctoral students. So if you have any questions, or if you face challenges in terms of getting that statement, please do write to us at fellowships at acls.org. I still encourage you to apply and we can work with the dean or department chair or DGS of your program to make sure that they understand what the stakes of the fellowship are and what kind of support we're asking. Once you submit your application, it undergoes a multi-stage peer review process. But the first stage is that ACLS will screen for eligibility and formatting. Please make sure that you are following the formatting guidelines as outlined on our competition page and our call for applications and in our application portal. Those are incredibly important. 
If you exceed these guidelines, your application will likely be held back and will not be submitted for peer review, which is something we really like to avoid. This is a matter of equity for us. We want to ensure that there's a level playing field where everybody has the same amount of space to make their case for their projects. We are strict about the formatting requirements, so please make sure to pay close attention to them. Once you get through that stage, your application will be read in a first round of peer review that's likely to include specialists in your field. So if you're in history, you'll be read by historians in your area and period, for literature, a literature scholar who works in your subfield, and so on. But at least one of the first round reviewers might be connected to your project in an unorthodox way, perhaps via methodology, time period, theme, or geography. A similar method of assignment applies across all fields. In the first round of peer review, we're also considering your proposed innovation. We recruit reviewers who cover a broad range of disciplinary areas, as well as scholars who have expertise in the types of innovation you are proposing to use in your project. So if you plan to introduce, produce a digital archive, we'll assign someone who has experience working on these kinds of projects themselves to review your application. If your application passes through the first stage to the second stage, it will be read by a multidisciplinary selection committee. These committees are made up of scholars from across the humanities and interpretive social sciences, and those scholars will be selected for their involvement in moving doctoral education forward in innovative directions. At least one of those members will be connected to your discipline, but the others could be in a variety of different disciplines. So you really will want to demonstrate the stakes of your approach to an audience that's outside of your field. Please consider that as you're putting together your proposal, and we'll talk about the best strategies for that. Please do read our website early and often. That early login is really important because that is where you're going to designate your reference letter writer and the person who's going to be providing your institutional statement. Please register, sign in, and put the name of the referee and their email contact address so that ACLS can send them an email requesting the reference letter or institutional statement. You want to be as kind as possible, considering they're getting many of these requests around this time, and to give them the lead time to respond and be able to write a strong letter. Given the number of components of the application, it can be helpful to create a checklist of application components and a timeline for completing them. It is important to match your goals and plans to the program objectives. You don't need to restate the program's objectives in your proposal, but a reviewer should be able to clearly see how the goals of the program are being advanced by the work that you propose. It is essential to spend time on your abstract, which should be a brief description of the project and the innovative research and dissertation project directions you will pursue. This is a piece of writing that should be additive and not duplicative of any text in your proposal. So please do not cut and paste the first paragraph of your proposal and put it into the abstract page. That is a major pet peeve of peer reviewers. I've heard many times from reviewers who are well aware that you only have so much space available to you and are aggravated on your behalf when you can't use that limited real estate as effectively as possible. Please use every square inch of the proposal to your best advantage. Every piece of the application counts. If we're asking for it, it's going to be part of our review process. Also, please think carefully about the broad humanistic significance statement. Given that the review committee is in the second, in the second stage as an interdisciplinary one, this is a critical piece of writing where you demonstrate the importance of your work across fields. Remember, this is a project, not just an idea. You may have some fascinating questions. You might have found really interesting ideas and phenomena that you want to be studying and thinking about. However, you want to show through your timeline and the formulation of your proposal how this fits into a broader arc of your dissertation research. Don't just focus on ideas here. You want to show that you're going to be using these 9 to 12 months as thoughtfully and intentionally as you can. It's really important to highlight your argument, but it's okay if you don't have it fully worked out because you're only at the very beginning of your dissertation research project. This argument can be not just about the research, it can also be about the work that you're doing in terms of the innovative qualities of your project. Why are you studying what you're studying? What do you hope to learn based on what you've observed already? What are some questions that you have? What are some things that you're expecting to see? 
And what are the preliminary arguments that are leading you toward what you're proposing? It's very important to be clear and avoid jargon. This is important because we have an interdisciplinary committee. Certainly jargon has its own use as technical language within a particular field, but it can be alienating for people who are outside of that culture of usage of that particular technical term. You will want to make sure that at every stage you're bringing your reader along and not alienating them. Please do consider whether a piece of jargon or a technical term is absolutely necessary in putting together your proposal or making your argument. If there are any significant terms that you feel are absolutely necessary, you should make sure to define them early on in your proposal. You really want to make sure that no one misunderstands how you are using a term and what it means in the context of your project. Grant writing is very much a team sport. I think it's important for people to think about the dialogue that they're engaging in with peer reviewers. And remember that whether you're successful or not, you will be eligible to receive feedback on your application. In the run-up to submitting the application, it can be useful to ask a friend, a colleague, and or advisor to read your draft and make sure that the project is very clear to them. What are you trying to argue? And is that something that they're able to take away from reading the application? It is also really important to share your proposal with your reference letter writer so that they can best put together a reference letter to complement and not duplicate anything that you're saying in your proposal. This is a great courtesy you can offer your letter writer. If you can provide a draft for them, that can be helpful in putting together the most cohesive application package. It is also very important to confirm your institutional statement criteria with the appropriate administrator at your university. If you have questions about completing that form, it's important to talk with your department chair or director of graduate studies about who the right person is to write that statement. That person has to be separate from your reference letter writer so say your referee is the department chair or is the, the director of graduate studies, then the person submitting the institutional statement shouldn't be the same person. It can come from the, a dean as well, and that might be required by your university to have a dean submit this letter of support. That could be a rule within your school. So find out who this person should be and log in early and input that information. You should also check our FAQ regularly. We will add questions that we receive in our fellowships at acls.org email address. There's a sample application on the website, so you can see all the different components in a PDF form. And then if you're able, you should feel free to attend the office hours that we're going to be offering for applicants throughout the summer and fall leading up to the competition deadline. During office hours, you'll be placed in a smaller group with a program officer and ACLS staff to answer questions about putting together your proposal. Space is limited for those because of the small group aspect. They're absolutely not required for submitting a strong application, but it's another resource that ACLS offers. And then finally, it's really important to remember the deadline. The application deadline is October 30th, 2024, 9 p.m. Eastern. Please do mark that when you're putting together your checklist of application materials and make sure you're working backward as carefully as possible to make sure that you have everything in by that time. We cannot offer extensions on the application deadline given the compressed schedule we have for peer review. Thanks again for watching this webinar. And if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to email fellowships at acls.org. Good luck.